Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the first Monday in August. This, uh, on this rainy day, we were just uh, noting that amazingly in the five plus years we've been doing these programs, it has never rained until today. So we now, we now see that uh, the rain clearly does not deter our regulars and newcomers <laughs> from joining. So welcome. Um, first, um, those of you who are very sharp of eye will have noticed an editorial mistake on the program, which is its last month's title. But on the subsequent pages, it's the right title. <laughs> um, uh, announcement, uh, in September, the first Monday is Labor Day, and so we are not going to be on Labor Day. It'll be the second Monday, which happens to be Monday, September 11th. So we'll be doing a program on 16 years after 9-11, the new challenges to public diplomacy, and uh, our moderator will be Sean Powers, the head of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy in the State Department, and he is putting together a remarkable program which will be informative, and uh, uh, I don't guarantee that it will help you sleep at night, uh, but uh, it will be interesting. Um, in the back, uh, regulars know, and uh, uh, for newcomers, all of the books and other documents on the table are for you. Uh, please feel free to uh, uh, take them. There are uh, four Public Diplomacy Council books. There is a fifth one, which uh, our, sp our speaker will have, non-traditional U.S. public diplomacy. This is only for PDC members. And if you want to become a member, uh, you should see uh, Bob Heath, if he's still here. And if Bob has left for Kiev already, he's going to Kiev today, um, then uh, see me. It's, um, as one of our members says, the price of membership includes uh, our proprietary calendar, which includes at least three free lunches a week, so it pays for itself. Um, partners. Uh, the, the presenters of these monthly meetings are the Public Diplomacy Council and the uh, U USC, Center, I should say University of Southern California, given our guest, the USC Center on Public Diplomacy, and There we go, the USC uh, Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy. And we have a new member of the uh, USC Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy who just joined us, and she's in the back, Greta Van Susteren. Good to see you. Today is J Day, which is a day celebrated around the world for educational exchanges. Now. To be completely honest, it was entirely an accident that Phil and I were talking months ago and we settled on August 7th, but uh, uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than to be smart. So um, we'll take a look. This is, as you can see, it's uh, being celebrated around the world in countries, uh, including the United States. And so uh, what better day to be discussing uh, this subject, which is education exchanges, but on the state level. And so it's also appropriate that we have with us, oh, right here in the front row, the um, CEO of the National uh, Association of Governors, uh, Scott, uh, uh, Scott Patterson, and uh, Tiffany Shackelford, uh, you're eating, so please don't stand, <laughs> who is the Director of Communications and Strategic Planning. So Scott and Tiffany, thank you for coming. The NGA is USC's new partner in cybersecurity and uh, much else, and they spent last week, uh, well, Scott spent last week in Los Angeles on campus uh, touring different labs that where uh, we'll be working together. But today, world-class scholars, uh, which is a program you will now hear much more about from our speaker, who uh, has uh, flown up. Uh, I think there are at least one or two others in the program who are here with him. But uh, our speaker is somebody I've known for some time. Um, we go back to what? I guess uh, there was this thing, this, this new thing called the internet. <laughs> and uh, we were both doing uh, the things related to that. You'll see a full bio of him on the back of the program. Um, and uh, But you can see he has uh, been very much involved in uh, civic space, in technology, and now is putting together at the state level a program to uh, initiate education exchanges, and um, it, it is going 
after piloting, it is now going to expand, and your target is a million students, correct? <laughs> initial, initial target. Well, without further ado, uh, Phil Noble. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam, uh, for Adam and I were, as he said, back in the early, early days when we were trying to decide if this internet thing was going to be a big deal or whether it was just the CB radio of the 90s. <laughs> well, I'm happy to tell you it ain't the CB radio. Uh, and there's another one, Mark Walsh, it, who was another very early guy in this process. Um, and thank you for what you're doing. I mean, the whole sort of diplomatic community writ large, which you're a part of, is um, the rest of us who have never been a part of it don't quite understand how profoundly you impact not just the diplomatic side, but the personal side of how the world sees us. I saw a poll one time that said the single greatest determinant of attitudes toward the United States was how much time that person overseas had spent with an American. Didn't matter what capacity, didn't matter where, professional, tourist on the street. And you guys are a part of that, what has created um, what the perception of, of us are in the world. So thank you for that. Um, I want to begin by asking you to imagine something. I want you to imagine a place that you have never been, but a place that's not undifferent from places that you have been. I want you to imagine a small rural county in near the southern tip of South Carolina called Allendale County. Allendale County is, only has about 500 square miles. A hundred years ago, there were 20,000 people in Allendale, South Carolina. It was a rural post-plantation, perhaps post-plantation, agricultural society. And then something magical happened. They got a golden river called a highway, 301, that brought people. It was the main highway from New York to Miami. And it brought wealth and prosperity with hotels and restaurants and shops. And then along came the interstate, and that went away. And the population of Allendale County today is less than half of what it was 100 years ago. It's 75% African American. It's one of the poorest counties in America. It's really not much different from a third world country, a lot of places in a third world country. And I want to introduce you to somebody, let me see if I can make this work, from Allendale. All right. Well, let me try a good old fashioned. All right, Chief, where's our tech guy? <laughs> the tech guy's in the bathroom. All right, man. <laughs> I didn't even get the first slide transition. How did I do that? Point out yeah. yeah, point. Yeah. Yep, point. Okay. We can point it anywhere. Point anywhere? Yes, sir. This is Annie. And Annie lives in Allendale. She's nine years old. And when we began World Class Scholars, we went to Allendale to start the project. Because we figured if we could make it work in Allendale, we could make it work in anywhere. And Annie was one of our most enthusiastic kids. Because what we did was hook up Allendale School that's on the Savannah River to a, a school in Port Victoria, Kenya 
that was on a river that's on Lake Victoria. And they studied water and agriculture and plants and growth. And they just had an amazing experience connecting once a week with these kids. And at the end of the school year, when the last class was there, I was down there and I said, I said, so Annie, what are you going to do this summer? And she said, oh, I got two things. She said, I figured it out. She said, my aunt's going to take me to the beach. You know, I've never seen the ocean. It's probably 15 miles down the road. And I said, oh, what else are you going to do? She said, you know, I got to study up on Africa this summer because I got friends in Kenya. <laughs> Halfway through the summer, the children's librarian at the public library called me and says, I just want you to know every book we have on Africa has been checked out this summer. Every book. And that's what we do. William Yates says, education is not about filling a bucket but lighting a fire. And that's what we do. World-class scholars lights fires. It lights fires in women, and children, young, somewhat young and old, not only in the United States, but around the world. And there are thousands of kids that now have had their fire lit about the world beyond where they live and the world beyond what they have ever seen. And that's an amazing thing to do. And we're very proud that we have done that. World-class scholars began in South Carolina, uh, former Governor, Secretary of Education, Richard Riley, was one of our inspirations for starting this. And we went through three years to get the pilot right and get the, make sure the project worked. And it does, and it works brilliantly. What we do is provide a real-time online exchange between schools in South Carolina and schools around the world. That's it. It's very simple. But in one sense, it's very profound. We create global classrooms. And we work for three years to build a project to reach a, bunch of, a number of milestones. And in March of this year, we began to launch globally. I want to show you this short video about a classroom, a third grade classroom, and how world-class scholars work for them. One of our projects is called World Class Scholars. It's an innovative project to connect children in South Carolina schools with partner schools around the world. The children come together to learn, connect, and share with each other about what it means to be a part of this larger global community. It's a real-time online exchange using the technology of the internet and other communications tools. When the program began, it was very exciting because, um, Mom, we are going to be talking across the world to Kenya. And I said, really? And she was extremely excited. Speaking of the devil, here she is. She was extremely excited about being able to be a part of something other than just here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really cool to watch her evolve from meeting the students to Skyping to um, learning all about their culture mm -hmm. and in ways in which they're just all still the same age group, but yet they're different mm -hmm. cultures, but yet they have a lot of similarities together as students. The vision is one thing to have, but the actual action of doing it, I think has just been overwhelmingly positive. And um, as we reflect on it, it's been more than just an enriching experience. You know, we talk about giving our kids real world experiences and we talk about trying to make them global thinkers but the bridge that we've been able to gap between cultures has been amazing really amazing and I just get excited um, every time I hear the kids talk about it every time I saw their faces and the faces of our kids over in Port Victoria connect I mean, it was nervous at first I me mean, talking to people across the world usually parents say don't do that <laughs> but it's it's very um, I don't say emotional but it's just, it gives you a different perspective of you and especially everybody around the world. Our experience has been really awesome and they've taught us so much and it's just 
awesome how we get to do this. We got to learn about their culture and see what they do. For Christmas, we sent them ramen noodles. My experience with Kenya has been phenomenal. And I really want them to learn about us too. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I can say is, we're Skyping with Kenya, yay. And we all learn from each other. They have learned so much. I don't know if they told you all about the gardening project that they started um, already. And when I walk out there and I take a look at the things that are growing, you know, um, the vegetables that are growing, I remember the lesson in the classroom that day when the children um, in Port Victoria were introducing them to the, um, the types of seeds they have there and their planting process and the kinds of crops that they have. And then I look at what Ms. Mack and the children have been able to do right here. Um, all summer long, I'm gonna be reminded of that. And not only um, have they started that, they wanna continue that. So they've been able to establish friendships. Um, they've been able to learn from other cultures. They've been able to um, appreciate all that they have, you know, available to them as far as resources, but they've also um, been able to see how very, very bright uh, the, the folks of Port Victoria are and how much they had to share with them. I just hope that this project continues. It's been a, it's been a great blessing and an opportunity as a first year teacher to experience this, to, you know, it's pretty profound when you're like, I'm talking to somebody live in Africa right now. It's pretty powerful that something of this magnitude has been available, made available, to children at the elementary school age. Who has ever even heard of an opportunity like this? We hear it oftentimes for older children. Definitely we hear college students being able to go abroad, but who has ever heard of an opportunity the doors being open for young children to begin to have those thoughts of exploration about what they want to do. Ultimately, it's about uh, uh, global thinking and learning from each other and building relationships so that what works in our society, we can help others to use that to work in theirs. And what works in theirs, we can use to help um, to bridge some of the gaps we have right here. What what do you guys like doing in school? I think what we're doing helps to keep the heart in technology. You know, as our world becomes more um, tech savvy, um, we can use that technology to build relationships with people and to keep relationships going. plants you saw grow and what the kids did they because they were studying water and agriculture and plants they took the seed plants that they grew in Kenya and they sent them to South Carolina and the same with the kids from South Carolina sent them over to there we didn't talk to the customs service but sorry. <laughs> um, and so they grew the plants and that was their project was growing and every week they'd come out and measure in real time you know our beans are bigger than your beans and and they went through this whole process and at the end they had a what they call their online feast where they were online they cooked up the food they invited their parents in you know and they you know here's my mama where's your mama and they would go through this whole process and and they they really uh, establish a real direct connection that has lasted from year after year after year um, we strongly believe that this is not just a nice to do, but as you get into the older grades, uh, it's about teaching young people the basic real life skills about economics, about how to use technology. Uh, we're working with uh, the Graduate School of Education at Harvard on developing the educational metrics that we're measuring, uh, because it really is about the real world. And if you look across not just South Carolina, but the United States and globally, we've got the same issues. We've got the same needs of what education needs to be in our country and globally. And we, we've got some very interesting early, early, early metrics about it has an, a, a big increase in, in student engagement, uh, literacy skills from global job skills, and it's the same. It's the same all over the world, those same, those same 
tools and, and strategies that the kids learn. The fourth thing, we provide everything for free uh, for grades 1 through 12. And we provide a turnkey solution. The minimum we need on the other, on the other, other side or any side is, a, is an adult, a group of kids that meet regularly, and a computer. That's it. They can get online. We've even had one school that just did it with a cell phone because they couldn't, they couldn't uh, uh, afford a, a big computer for everybody. So we provide th these four things. We provide uh, the global partner schools. We match the schools. We're match.com for teachers <laughs> is what it is. That really is what we do. We provide the technology platform. We work with Google, a content platform, and support service. I won't go through each of them, uh, but these are the institutions that help us develop the initial partners, uh, UNESCO, Peace Corps, British Council. We've now gone to Google AdWords, so we can recruit teachers anywhere in the world, in any language, um, with Google AdWords. They're an amazing company, and we'll I'll tell you a little bit more about them later. Uh, and we use Google Hangout as our technology platform. Uh, MIT Media Lab has built the front end um, and uh, I'm sorry, the back end, Google is providing the front end and part of the platform, and we want to be able to move, move the whole thing, obviously, from just uh, a lap, from desktop to laptops to phones to phones. Um, and we provide, basically, templates for the two teachers. We don't care if you're third grade, fifth grade, if you're teaching math, if you're teaching geography. We provide a template, basically where a teacher who's teaching geography in South Africa and a teacher in Wisconsin, this week you teach about mountains, next week I teach about rivers, next week you teach about weather. You're teaching the same thing anyway, but what you're doing is providing a set of tools for them to do what they're already doing in a more interesting, engaging way. And we know one of the first statistics we figured out in every class in the United States and all 26 countries is attendance goes up the day they connect. Kids love it. They show up. One of my favorite teachers, I was asking her, why, why is this so successful? And she said, and she wasn't being flipped, she said, Phil, we just sort of connect the kids and get out of the way. And that really is what, what they do. We provide a structure, we provide a framework, we provide some channels, but you basically connect the kids and get out of the way. We had one teacher call me up um, after they'd been in the program for about five months, and she called me and she said, Phil, I'm so embarrassed. I said, what, what? She said, they were connected with a school in Croatia. And she said, I just found out our kids had set up a joint Facebook account, Twitter account, Instagram account with Croatia. Is that okay? I said, well, of course it's okay. <laughs> you know, and she didn't even know it. She, they'd been doing it for five months and she didn't even know it. Um, and we provide the support to the teachers uh, with handbook, how to. Uh, we provide every kid uh, with a world-class scholar's diploma. We'll show you that. Um, and, and the, again, the course, the subject doesn't matter. We don't care what it is. We just want to help you try to fa establish some sort of sense of connectivity. Uh, that you're, you know, you're both on a river. Both schools have had somebody who was a sports hero. Uh, one of my favorites was in Ireland. We, uh, there was a little town in South Carolina called Gaffney, which was founded by a man named Michael Gaffney in 1788. Well, we connected him with the school in the town where he came from. And so they studied how the progression of their, of their, of their little communities uh, developed in parallel over three, over three centuries. And, and I'll tell you one of my favorite stories that was a little, I, I went up and I, I always interviewing these kids and I was asking them, what, what was the big surprise? What'd you learn? And it was a, it was a black kid, it was about 15. And I said, what'd you learn? I said, what surprised you? He said, discrimination. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I thought I knew what discrimination was, right? I'm black, I live in a white town. I, I get that. He said, but you know, in Ireland, 
they got white people who discriminate against white people based on when they go to church. Now, is that the dumbest thing you've ever heard in your whole life? <laughs> and he's right. And that's, that's, that's what this, this is all about. Um, these were the, um, they, they all get a diploma at the end of the course. Uh, this school in Gaffney was paired with this school in the cross. And when this school, school burned down, these kids raised the money to buy them a computer so they could keep going. Fernando Reimers is pretty much acknowledged to be the leading expert on global education. How do you measure standards and, and, and uh, performance across cultures, across languages? Uh, and he's been working with us from the very beginning to help us develop this in such a way that it, that as he said, will essentially be working toward essential competencies in 21st century learning that will apply across across the globe. Um, we're really proud of this. From, from our, we're beginning in September will be our, our uh, fifth year. And from year two to three, three to four, every teacher in every class in the United States and globally that participated in the project renewed for the next year. 100%. 100%. It's a very, very simple model, which is why it works so effectively. Um, and as, again, we worked for, for about three years to get the model right before we decided we want to try to scale this thing. Um, this is where we are now, the, the blue country, the green countries is where we, where we are. Uh, the, the, the blue countries are where we're expanding to. Uh, we've been, we've been able to connect schools from as far east as the western part of uh, India all the way over to the eastern part of China. Now, somebody has to get up early and somebody has to stay up late, uh, <laughs> but they will. <laughs> they will. They're excited to do that. Um, the technology side of this is, is really being managed by MIT Media Lab. And I did a lot of work with them early on and, and did a lot of work with the BBC. And we, we really developed this uh, to scale it globally. And the, the fact that we've been able to enlist uh, the kind of sheer brain power uh, that we have is part of what's making it work. You know, Google says they want to organize all the world's information, right? Well, we've been hanging around with them too long, and we want to connect all the world's schools. All of them. <laughs> Who knows if we'll ever get there? Probably not. But when we work that with this, this next level of our global expansion to go beyond South Carolina to English language schools anywhere in the world, it could be Ireland and South Africa, it could be India and Argentina, uh, our goal was, uh, our goal is, uh, within three years, 10,000 schools and, and a million students. And when you hang around the Google folks long enough, they go, man, if we get this right, we can do that in a year, easy. Well, who knows? But, but it is developed to scale that quickly. Uh, this year, 17, 18, will be in English language only. Any countries, any two countries can connect. The next year, uh, the BBC is in 28 languages, and a lot of the concepts we developed here were developed with work I did for about 10 years with the BBC. And so we hope that BBC will be our partner in the next school year to be able to do this in 28 languages. And then it gets really interesting. Google says, more or less, within three years, they'll be able to do 100 languages, simultaneous, real-time transactions translation. You speak in Mandarin, they hear it out in Portuguese. Now that could get really interesting really quick. Um, as I said, these are our expansion partners in technology, MIT, Media Lab, Google, BBC, uh, Kennedy School, and Harvard. And uh, Again, these have been terrific partners to date, but now that we're moving to Google AdWords, 
to recruit these folks, uh, we're not limited to just where they are working even. This was the South Carolina startup phase. Uh, I won't bore you with all the details. A lot of smart people and a lot of generous folks in South Carolina. Um, we raised about 600000 in our pilot phase. Uh, we, we need about a million dollars uh, by the end of this year to ramp up and then about a, another million dollars in the, in the following 12 months uh, to make it work. Um, we're, we're working with a variety of organizations to develop sort of long-term strategy and hopefully some long-term funding goals, uh, Coke, BBC Trust. Uh, GM Foundation is really interested in using this to partner schools around their facilities around the world a GM plant in Mexico and a GM plant in South Africa. It's fine with that. Uh, United Arab Emirates is very interested in doing this for, uh, for their whole country. Uh, we're talking with the State Department about developing an initial pilot project with Indonesia and Hawaii and then four other projects that will be pilot projects for there. Uh, we're hoping that will come to fruition pretty quickly. Um, the big idea is that it's a, it's a pilot that has worked. There's Matthew. Yeah, Matthew has been our UAE guy for Etihad Airlines, and we're, we're counting on you. If we can't get it work, we want an airplane. All right? Just one. Just one. Um, but the, but we, we really have, as I said, spent four years getting the pilot right, and we now believe we can scale globally. And so... Our business model from day one has always been what I call the Tom Sawyer business model, which is you call up your friends and ask them to come help you paint the fence, and you try to get them to help you pay for the, pay for the paint. And so we are constantly looking for new friends, people who can provide with ideas and inspiration, school partners, business partners, financial partners. Um, Accenture has just come on to help us figure out how to manage the process of growth of money and technology and management and schools, which is the, the growth process. So um, that's, the, that's the project. Uh, and we think the, the goal is that uh, with this, students can learn, connect, and share on a global basis, and, um, and that's the deal. So, questions? Sir, you were. Well, this is impressive. Um, we had uh, international classrooms, I think, on a college level in, on, when Margaret taught while I was undersecretary. But mm -hmm. again, I felt with that, my memory is that there wasn't enough, okay, so what's the next step? The human connection. Yeah. And this, what this screams at me is, okay, when there's a really successful uh, duo established um, and maybe there's some money or organizational backbone, how do you get this connected up with actual student exchange programs or, or the like? Yeah, we, we've got, we were going over it last Thursday. We have 106 expansion options <laughs> that people have, have presented to us and said, what about it, could you do this? Could you add this in? Could you add that in? Could you add this in? There, it's, it's the flexibility and the simplicity of it just begs for all these other kinds of, of things. The, the short answer is we don't know. We, we, want, we want to expand as fast as we can to as many schools as we can. And then once, once we have got the model working where we are, excuse me, bringing on thousands of schools a day, which is where we think we can get to within probably two or three years, then we can sort of develop that list of options of all these other things. The problem that we encountered is if we go off of the model, then we've got some sense of responsibility to say, well, that's a good project. That's a good organization. That's a good whatever. And we're just not in a position to do that kind of vetting at this point. But we want to. We want to figure out how to get there, but we're just not there yet. You, you were going to follow up? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
right behind you. Um, I was working at the embassy in Mongolia this spring, and there was an informal version of this going on that had been started by a high school here in Falls Church. Um, so I have a couple questions based on that. One of the problems was the time difference. Mm -hmm. So they ended up having to Skype on Saturdays. Yeah. They didn't do it during yeah. school time. But it, it also wasn't school to school. It was school to American Corner in Mongolia. Uh, an initial problem that was overcome was that the U.S. school was wary, as they mentioned, mm -hmm. of having their kids out there on the Internet, which was a surprise to me in Mongolia that it was the U.S. school that was the one that was putting up the obstacles. But that was overcome, but I can see how you have that. And my final question is, why is Mongolia not on the expansion? <laughs> <laughs> town full of lawyers, I probably shouldn't say this, but our, our view is that our legal counsel said, just do what you want to do, and if somebody writes you a letter and says, stop and call me, and that's really what we've done. We, we don't, we work through the individual teachers. You know, if a teacher discovers the project, they can sign up and do it. They don't have to ask anybody's permission. If they're okay, we're okay. Uh, and Again, we got no real assets, so we're <laughs> so we got some protection for a while. Uh, <laughs> but 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 the reality is, what we're gonna what we're gonna have a sort of you know click here, one of these click here that you agree to all this stuff that you know nobody ever reads and you don't know what it says. Um, but but we don't have that answer yet. Uh, but we're getting there. Mong Mongolia out. I'll talk to you later because I worked in 1997. The Mongolian Supreme Court was online before the U.S. Supreme Court. And I'll tell you the story about how that came about. So I'd love to have Mongolia on it. Mark? First, uh, congratulations. It's fabulous. And uh, it's great to see you're doing something good with your life besides being a lowly political consultant. So <laughs> tremendous progress. I'm interested if you think that this will have an impact on either side of the connection in pursuing higher ed, that, that a higher percentage of the kids in that county you mentioned will go on to college because of this kind of exposure. Is that something you're hoping to track and see some traction on? Yeah, uh, we, we've got a, we, this project actually began out of the College of Charleston, South Carolina. And so we've got some pathways we want to try to do that. Uh, in our big long list of things, we want to go to we want to go to colleges and universities and say give us scholarships for our kids. Um, you know, it once you get them connected and you got that process, the sky's the limit on all these other things. Plus the metrics of it, we don't we we, we simply follow the classes from year to year now visa the teachers. Once we get the technology through MIT done kids can go on, they'll log in, and then we can track their behavior in terms of what, how often they're on, who they connect with, what they learn, how they, you know, measuring their performance stuff. Um, I, we had a guy the other day come and said, look, you need to get every kid, once he signs up, to get a world-class scholar's email, and they'll keep it the rest of their life. Yeah, yeah. And, and so we're we're looking at how to do that. We, we do that with China. China has got um, the, the work we've done with China. They've started out with the students emailing each other as opposed to live, uh, real time, which we want to move them into. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. From project to project or year to year for the students? Um, the, the short answer is not yes, but not yet, but I'll tell you where we're going with it. Um, Google Hangout has the ability to capture the video on both sides. And Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia was really helpful to us early on in thinking about how to, to do this. And what we want to do is we want to capture the video and then we want to tag it. fifth grade geography, Mongolia, South Africa, English language, and then let the students and teachers rate it. 
and then put it up like a Wikipedia page where other teachers can look at it, evaluate it, add to it, improve it, so that every class becomes a volume, if you will, in an online lesson library of what the students and teachers themselves around the world have generated. And it, like a TED Talk where they organize it based on popularity and how often they come to it. That's, I mean, we're, we're just, just beginning. We've sort of figured out theoretically how we want to do it, but we hadn't, we hadn't started that yet. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for an excellent presentation. One thing that comes to mind that I wasn't clear about was you mentioned that the BBC has programs in 28 languages. Um, the students, I assume, are not yet bilingual or multilingual. Are they communicating with English-speaking countries only, or do they go with other countries and other languages at a certain point, or is there simultaneous translation? Yeah, there's no, trans no, no translation yet. Previous to now, uh, up until today, it, almost all the classes have been English language only. But, for example, we, had a, we got a great program in Morocco and another program in Brazil. Well, somehow they found each other separate from South Carolina, so they connected. And they're doing this in English. You know, we've got, we do have a, I think, a Spanish and German class in South Carolina that's hooked up with Spain and, I take that back, I think it's Mexico and Germany. But by and large, it's English language. But once we get through this year and we have the English language, the template and the materials, et cetera, it's just, it's just basically hitting a button not literally, but hitting a button and you translate everything into those 27 languages, which is what the BBC is very skilled at doing and we're hoping that they will, they will do that, help us do that. Uh, but, but, you know, it doesn't matter where the kids are. And the only reason it has to be English is because, well, they got to read the stuff and they got to figure it out together. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, this is such a fantastic idea. It's so simple. It's so easy. It's so effective. I'm on the internet all the time, and I'm thinking to myself, why don't I know about this? And I want to know if there's some plan, if you have, you know, a partnership with Google or something. I mean, when you have a model that's so simple, so effective, and we're probably all thinking, why didn't I think of this sitting here? Um, do you have some sort of plan? Because to the extent that you get it out there, more will participate, and I suspect the funding will be an easier, and it's sort of avalanches forward yeah it, it, the, there was a wonderful commercial pardon me for the digression back in the internet early internet age where these guys in a startup had they, they were all gathered around a computer and they hit the button and waited for the counter for their first customer and it went to one and they went crazy ah oh, that's wonderful and then it went to two and they jumped again and then before long, it was, it was spinning so fast they couldn't handle it, and they were all scared to death. That's part of our problem. We, we are scared to death that, that, that this thing is going to grow faster than we can accommodate it. Uh, and that's why you hadn't heard of it. I mean, we, the only thing we've done publicly outside of South Carolina, we had an event in March, uh, and somebody from USA Today, if you saw in here, somebody from USA Today showed up, and... We, we almost had to say, no, 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 don't, 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 don't. But, uh, because we, we can't handle, we're, 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 building the, we're building the airplane as we're heading down the runway, is what it boils down to. Uh, and what I'm thinking about on the back here, j just as a perfect example, um, my email is Phil at World Class Scholars, and I got a text on the way over that something went down on our server and my email isn't working this morning. So go to... Uh, Richard Walker, who's back here, uh, who's working with us, use his email to contact me. So that's, again, that's the short answer to what you're saying. We just don't have the capacity yet to, you know, Google or BBC or any of these guys can turn on the fire hose whenever we're ready. We're just not ready for that fire hose 
and, and we're in the process of trying to gather more partners, uh, more money, more whatever, as we sequence that growth. Does that answer your question? Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have just a couple quick questions. How often do they meet? Once a week, once a month? We ask them to meet once a month. I mean, once a week, same time, every week. Uh, probably about 60%, two-thirds do meet every, every week. Uh, probably about another 20% meet every other week, and then the other ones are, are sort of catch as catch can. But we, we ask them. They, they commit to do once a week. Okay, and so you mentioned templates, like a <coughs> curriculum for different subjects. So who creates that curriculum? And I don't mean to be a downer, but no, I mean no. there are certain standards of learning that each state has. So that curriculum has to be approved. And if the teachers are actually taking that much time every week to meet, then that's taking, I mean, is that curriculum approved and so that those kids can pass those standards of learning yeah. we, each we don't, year? We, we, don't, we don't create any curriculum. And the teachers, if you're a fifth grade geography teacher right. in Montgomery County and you're a fifth grade geography teacher in Georgetown, South Africa, you're teaching geography anyway. Correct. And you're teaching it together. And this week we say, okay, just a template. Okay, we're going to have six lessons. You teach mountains, you teach rivers, you teach weather, you teach crops. You're going to teach that anyway in your course. Uh, and, and you just sort of do what you're already going to do, but you do it with somebody else on the other side of the world. And they do it with you. Okay. All so right, that's what you. makes, that's, that's part of the simplicity of it. And again, the only thing that's required is a teacher to go, I like that. They don't have to get approval. If they're okay, we're okay. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up? Uh, are you aware of programs like this that, that you've seen? I, I work at the Department of Education. Uh, I actually work in post-secondary education. Um, I, no, I, I haven't heard of anything in our elementary and secondary school POCs that they have something like this. So we'll have to talk yeah. more about that. I mean, there are, a bunch of, there are a bunch of online education things out there. But our, uh, again, I, I, I spent too much ha time hanging around BBC and Google. I want, I want 100 million users. Uh, you know, and, and that's w the way we designed it, to be very simple, very quick adaption, and, um, and very flexible. Thank you. Um, the examples in the, in the video were, uh, were basically with elementary school students. Um, but I noticed the information says that it is grades 1 through 12. So I'm just wondering if, um, if you have found a difference in the, in the receptivity of, of the older students to the younger students and, and also the teachers, if, uh, if the teachers have been as, as receptive at the high school level as, uh, as at the elementary school level. Yeah. Well, it tends to go like this. The elementary schools tend to be sort of class to class driven. And you saw the teacher up there sort of managing as teachers manage. As they go up and they get older, the teachers often pair them off into, okay, you three guys here and you three guys in Croatia, y'all do a project on X together or whatever it is. And as they get older, they. It, it becomes much more individualized where they work on individual projects together. So that's the general progression. And, and I, I showed the third grade because that was actually, that was the first third grade we did, first class we ever did was that one relatively affluent white school, largely white school. And then we wanted to go to the, to the other end of the spectrum with Annie's school. Uh, in terms of the teachers, the biggest determinant of teacher interest is their age. <laughs> it's their age. Young, you know, we, we, we went through this huge training thing where we, we, we developed handbooks and we developed all this stuff 
and we'd get all these teachers the first year or so, and we'd put them through this. Well, we'll allow four hours for training. They'd walk in and they'd go, got it. What else? You know, the, the younger kids, younger teachers intuitively get this stuff. They understand the technology, um, and, and, and the older they are, you know, they can be as interested, but they're just not as proficient. Yeah, you you you've looked you've raised your hand three times. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, just right off of that, then um, on that same line of thinking, are you doing anything to recruit then young people to help roll out this program? Help to what? Uh, to roll out this program and to expand it. Do you have young people who are very comfortable with technology? Um, one of my other questions was, have you analyzed any of the differences between? Um, using face-to-face -face interactions, so like video, as opposed to just direct messaging yeah. um, applications. And I want to know if that makes a difference in kind of the outcomes that students are receiving. Uh, the first question is, is tech help. Um, we are going to have, notice the phrase going to have, we're going to have a section, the next section of the site, which is sort of a technical teacher's lounge where teachers can go and talk to each other and figure out what's working, what's not. And then we'll have a, a geek lounge where kids of any age can say, yes, I want to volunteer, I'll help if you've got a problem. So we, we again, that's, that's a sort of self-generating generating piece. Um, what was the second question? Oh, learning outcomes based on, yeah. We, we strongly, strongly urge them to do real-time FaceTime uh, work. And as I said, probably 60 to 60, 65 percent of them are that way. The other ones are often transitory, you know, that, that supposedly the kids in, in China are too shy to, to start out immediately, plus they need more time, their English is difficult. The accents are real are often a problem in elementary grades uh, because I mean even the kids in Kenya, the, the the two most often repeated phrases on both sides are, "Can you say that again slower?" And number two, "Would you please talk clearly?" <laughs> so everybody thinks they're talking clearly, uh, but after a while they 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 sort of. Their ears adapt. Again, the older the kids, a little bit easier than the younger kids. Yeah. To you know, extend those conversations. Just because I know I I did yeah you know ELS teaching abroad, and I still talk to my students with WhatsApp all the time, yeah. and they use it all the time yeah well th there are, again it's it's a process of layering in more technology more applications more help and of our whole list whatsapp is pretty high on that list uh, the, uh, early on early on we want to try to keep it teacher directed so that the kids at least develop okay we're going to focus on rivers or plants or creating media or a day in the life of a school or whatever is the, the, the process. We want to try to channel it through the teachers to start with. Uh, but you, know, you can't make it like that very quickly. Yes, ma'am. We have a question all the way in the back. Oh. Hi, hello. Um, I have two questions. My first question is, is um, what's the selection process when selecting which countries that you all will be um, connecting with and also um, with government relations on the country that you're working with in our country how big of that how big of an issue is that when deciding um, who to partner with depending on what's happening in the country politically um, that you're all partnering with in our and I, I sort of have to talk about it pros before now and then now going forward Go, before now we just went to these partners that you saw Peace Corps and UNESCO and said where you got schools and we sort of hooked them up now as we're moving into the next phase 
is a part of the sign-up interest process. We ask teachers, where would you like to connect with? What part of the world or, or so on? And with Google AdWords, we think we can find them. So we think we can do that. Uh, the second is uh, the question about the government relations part. Um, again, I don't mean to be flip, but we just ignore that. <laughs> we, we just, you know, if a teacher wants to do it, we want them in the program. You know, they don't have to sign a piece of paper. They don't have to go get anybody's approval. If they want to do it, we want them to do it. Now, um, have you made any connections with the Teach for America program, which would bring you lots of young, enthusiastic teachers and get you into more inner city schools? Yes, we have. Uh, we have, uh, there's Teach, and there's a global version of that called Teach for All as well. And we, we know those guys. We've done, uh, uh, all I can say is they're on the list. We, we have done, we do have a few, we have a few, I think, Teach for America schools in South Carolina, but now as we open it up to anybody in the world, we're happy to have them anywhere. What's your um, overall goal? Is it to improve education? Is it to provide a really neat experience for kids, to integrate people better in the world? What, what would you say is your capsule mission statement? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would say the capsule mission statement is the three words, connect, learn, and share. We want to connect kids around the world through schools. And it's that connection that we think is the first step in everything. Just creating the connection where they have a relationship. You know, it's a, we're, we're a digital pen pals, right? Uh, creating that connection. And then the second is the, the learn. We, we do believe, and that's why we've got uh, Fernando Reimers up at, up at Harvard. We, we do believe that there's a certain set of educational skills and talents that, are cons that will be consistent, consistently important globally. And we want to try to channel and direct the kids and the classes toward those skills, toward those subjects, if you will. And there are a number of ways we can do that. And then the third is just share. We, we think that once, once you, begin to con you begin to create content, you begin to, begin to create class class activities, you begin to create class lessons, then we want to be able to share it with the world. We want to be able to, to, to make that as ubiquitous as possible. And again, we, we are, I am the first one, the first one to tell you how just absurdly audacious what it is we're trying to do is. Um, and, and I think we were totally crazy if we didn't have guys like Google and MIT Media Labs and BBC going, yeah, yeah, we can, we can do that. We can do that. Again, it's a process of being able to handle to go from a few schools in South Carolina to pick your, pick his, pick your number. Well, uh, <laughs> that, that is not a cue to end the program, but I... <laughs> But I do, uh, before we end, I do want to put our friends uh, from the NGA on the spot here. Uh, Scott, uh, you're the uh, CEO of the National Governors Association. Uh, this, uh, here we are in Washington, D.C., where we usually think of the federal government as the initiator of anything that's international, certainly global exchanges. But this is an example of a state-level initiative. Do uh, uh, you have any reaction to this? Well, yeah, I, I just think it's really exciting to see because what we're seeing at the National Governors Association is something very different we haven't seen before, which is a real outreach to uh, subnational governments from subnational governments. So you have uh, premiers uh, in Canada, governors in Mexico reaching out to state officials and much more so, and they realize the importance of that interaction. So it's really exciting because this, I think this type of interaction, this connection is critical to part of that process. And, and when he told me you were coming, I said, I gotta talk to that man. <laughs> <laughs>
because I, I, I'm, anyway, we'll, as they say, we'll talk. I, I do have uh, one last question for you. You had a slide, uh, a few slides before, saying you're trying to raise a million dollars. That wasn't a typo. That was a million, not yeah. billion. A million. Yes. A million. <laughs> well, the, the problem is if somebody handed us five million, we'd be happy to take it. But, but we, we couldn't productively spend uh, more than a million dollars in the next six months. And we figure we probably can't spend more than a million dollars in the 12 months after that, just simply because of the, the capacity issue of ramping up. Um, so, I mean, it's relatively cheap by all. Well, thank you. And in, in some ways, you've sort of come full circle. At age nine, you began in the public sphere by handing out leaflets for John Kennedy's campaign. And now you're back to dealing with nine-year-olds. So. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking our speaker. And, and do speak to me or Dick back there uh, if you if you got some way that you think you can help and be involved. Because again, you know, with our Tom Sawyer model, it's a big fence we're trying to paint. So we need all the friends we can get. So thank you. Thank you, and uh, our next program is Monday, September the 11th. Until then, we're adjourned.